All right, it looks like we have Councilmember Tuttle online with us. So I think we, I think we have everyone. Uh, so let's get started. Thank you, Mayor. Um, nothing on page one other than just to note you've got three proclamations and an award. Um, on page two, uh, number one, new council business. This would uh, set a date of hearing for the Stadium Hotel TIF project plan. You have approved the TIF, uh, creation of the TIF district, but you have not put in place the project plan that reflects the development agreement with EPC. So this would uh, talk about the construction of a 155 room hotel, 150 unit apartment complex, 10,000 square feet of retail space, and 260 space garage. Again, that's all consistent with what you've already previously approved. Uh, estimated investment uh, in the project is $110 million on the part of EPC. What was the original projected investment for that project? Well, it was in phases, and I don't remember the at the end of the. Yeah. 65 million? Versus 110? Okay. Bob, we're getting a lot of constituent questions about pulling it out of the TIF and <coughs> creating a new TIF. Can, can we kind of briefly go through Yeah, that? Troy, you want to address that? Yeah, so. Uh, go to Mike. <laughs> Join us. Welcome to the table. Testing. <laughs> um, okay, so. Yes, this is a two-part. First and foremost, the only thing that transpires on Tuesday is setting a public hearing on November 21st, right? There's no, there's no action. There's no public input by state law. We have to set a public hearing for this. That's the only thing that's transpiring on Tuesday is we're simply requesting to set a public hearing for November 21st for two items. Number one is an amendment to the original development plan. Right? So the, the original district that was created, the Delano Ballpark Redevelopment District, was step one. Then there was a redevelopment plan which m mirrored the boundaries of the district, okay? And that m took into consideration all development projects within the entire district, okay? Which included hotel, office, retail, so on and so forth. So as that project has evolved, right, now that we're introducing multifamily residential rather than office, office market's gotten soft. As that project has evolved, we're also contemplating, as you may recall, um, we're proposing to own and operate the parking structure rather than it being a private st parking structure that's now a public, it would be a public parking structure. Um, so there's just some nuances that have changed as well as so project scope has changed, cost of construction has changed, the overall project has gone from again, what I think was originally like some 65 million now to well over 110 million, right? Um, so all of these changes, there's an opportunity to go in and separate and create within the original project boundaries two project areas, right? So under the new project area, it includes not only the hotel and multifamily residential, the retail and the parking, but also those riverfront improvements uh, on the east side of McLean. So those become two different project areas within the same original plan and sets forth, again, more definition around the project scope that's actually been proposed as part of the development agreement that you all approved earlier this year. So again, Okay. There's kind of rhyme and reason to why we're doing this in order to get the necessary um, um, entitlements in place so that the developer can continue to achieve uh, the benchmarks of commencement of construction next year. And so we're continuing to just follow the timeline, the development timeline associated with this. Next Tuesday just sets the public hearing for November 21st, wherein we can get public comment and then council can take action at some point in the future. But by state law, we have to set a public hearing. Okay. Has council taken any action to establish a separate TIF prior to this? Or is this the first time the council's taken action on that? Go ahead. On this particular district, no. On other districts, yes. This is common for uh, a project plan associated with the district to set forth 
that the district boundaries and project areas within the district boundaries may change and evolve because you don't know when you set up the district in the original project plan all the projects that are going to get presented to you at some point in the future right so these these are somewhat fluid types of plans it's not uncommon to amend a project plan, create a new project area, create a new project plan as those projects present themselves. That's not uncommon. This is the first one for this particular district and plan. Okay. The questions I'm being asked is what's the value of new project area and is that value being taken away from the original state right. of debt that we looked at? Oh. I think you guys are probably getting that question. No, too. no. Yeah. Nothing's being taken away from the original. All the same. In fact, if anything, again, the numbers have gotten larger, right? right? Because um, cost of construction has gone up. So all of the sales tax that's being generated will go back in to pay off the stadium. <laughs> um, all of the transient gas tax dollars that are going to be generated go back to pay on the stadium. There's nothing that has changed, so to speak, in any of the dollars being contemplated to pay off the stadium and what was previously committed to TIF to go towards paying off a hotel, an office building at that point in time in retail. Again, the only thing that's changed is multifamily residential and replaceable. Maybe office. maybe let's bring it back to what you approved when the when you we cut the deal with EPC. This codifies that, right, and allows us to collect the TIF dollars and that will go for developer incentives and for debt service for the stadium. It and will. It will. Debt it will go towards yes. debt service. And in the PowerPoint presentation on Tuesday to help address that question, okay. um, we'll go ahead and show that whole, uh, that, that incentive okay. chart that we had before, and that'll show all of the revenue sources. Okay. And I Correct. apologize, I'm asking a lot of questions because okay. Council Member Fry and I are gonna be out of town and we're gonna have limited yep. no. access yep. to yep. Yep. see what's going on. Um, another question, I, and, and again, I'll be looking for what percentage um, will be going to debt service for the stadium. Um, you don't know that number off the top of your head, do you? So, uh, again, that table that yeah. was provided in the staff report uh, back uh, when you all approved the new development agreements earlier this year. That's the model that we're looking at. It goes through all of the various uh, aspects of the project, all the revenue streams associated with it, yeah. and how that has evolved from the original development plan to the 22 plan, and even now, you can see how there will be an increased revenue stream across all of okay. us. Seeing a TIF go toward multifamily, I think, the city did this on Top Golf. Is that something we've exercised at other times too? Yes, TIF has been used in multifamily <coughs> residential. Yeah, that's Do not. Do you have any other examples? Um, man, not place. off the top of my head. I, I we think can get some. I, we we, we at, someone asked that. One of the council members asked that question previously, and I know we identify those. We can find that yeah. information. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay. Thanks, George. There is an apartment. There is an apartment. Is, is, is there any way I can get a copy of the slides or something prior to the meeting just since, since I maybe won't be able to attend? Absolutely. Okay. So I, I, I am concerned if this is more of a hot topic, uh, which it has been um, when it comes to getting information out, uh, ensuring that um, folks, I think, understand the difference between voting for a TIF and voting for a, um, uh, a public hearing. But if we're going to have two council members out, I am concerned about taking on something that has generated a, a lot of interest uh, if we're not going to be at full strength uh, when it comes to uh, our, our voting power and also our, our discussion. And frankly, no offense to my colleagues, uh, two of the most uh, um, experienced uh, legislative minds that are on the bench will, will be gone uh, for this. And so uh, I, I'm a, I'm wondering if we were to put this off until we we're at full strength as far as institutional knowledge, as far as uh, if that would be a better, it, which gives us a little more time to talk about, I think, what um, the intention is uh, for staff and others to talk about that. Uh, would, would that be something that uh, I, the council would be more interested in? Yeah. Uh, if we Put Mayor, it off, we yeah, get these guys if, back. If I can, I gave some thought to that, right? Because I knew we'd be down to and you know, ample notice. The only problem with that is it, it pushes us back into next month for the establishment of the hearing date, and then that pushes that off a month as well. And getting these getting this in place keeps us on a time frame 
for the developer to deliver on the uh, schedule that we have, right? And so I, I, I didn't want to lose time and I wanted to keep the developer on development of plans and getting something out of the ground and that was the only reason. If we didn't have a public hearing scheduled for the 21st of November, I would say, yeah, I would I definitely understand that, but the real meat of the issue is going to be on the 21st, and it gives us over a month now to answer questions that come up, not just from council members going forward, but also from the public. So we got a lot of time to address those issues. Um, uh, it, you're, it's up to you, but that's the reason why I didn't recommend it. Of course. It would only be two weeks. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and I get the administrative uh, um, perspective of keeping things on, on schedule. I think that's why, you know, you, you all um, work towards keeping our development opportunities moving ahead. That's, that's kind of y'all's uh, role. Ours is to also navigate, I, I think, the, um, the, the, the public uh, information as well sure. uh, and making sure that folks know what's happening and that they are comfortable uh, uh, with the direction we're, we're heading. So, I, again, like, I think it's something we should talk about uh, and uh, perhaps, uh, you know, as we move forward with it, uh, um, just as a council, I, I just went through that as an idea. We don't have to come up with, an, with, with a, we don't have to come up with a plan at this moment, but we should be thinking about when it, if, when it does come up on a bench, do we want to put it off until we're a better information out there until we can actually address some of these issues until we have Councilmember Fry, Councilmember Bluebaugh back uh, on the bench uh, or do we want to keep moving forward? So I just want to throw that out there to, to the council. Um, I, I think the, I, I understand the administrative's uh, uh, perspective and I also understand uh, the public uh, um, uh, desire for more information uh, in, in, in this as well. So I think it's going to be one of those interesting uh, issues as we walk forward on, on you know how to best to handle it policy wise but also when it comes to communicating and interacting with the public uh, and ensuring that um, that they know the, the intention and, and what we're doing I, I guess mayor um, if councilmember Fry and I don't have the opportunity to participate in the meeting and you guys aren't comfortable with it you guys could always at that time make make a motion to put it out till the first week. Of and that's why I'm, that's why I'm throwing out there is that we have other options if we need to. Um, well, I'd love to I shouldn't say this because I know that the media is watching this. I was going to say, well, I'd love to FaceTime you guys while you're rolling dice between meetings. And <laughs> uh, I'm not sure if we're going to get the, uh, the full effect of um, discussion uh, that, that we would get if you guys were there with us. So, uh, and I recognize that, you know, you all, you know, I think, I'm pretty sure Jeff, excuse me, Councilmember Bluebaugh is the longest serving uh, uh, council member uh, since, since decades. So I kind of I kind of want you guys at the table when these questions come up. You got the institutional knowledge. Uh, um, you know, I don't think anyone reads closer detail than Brian Fry does. I think that there's a it just feels like as we, we go through this, if it's more controversial, uh, we're always better off with um, uh, folks at the table who, who can help us navigate uh, the, the public discussion as well. So, uh, Just real quick, uh, two questions. Um, you said that this happened before. Were you talking about other municipalities, or do we have any examples of this in Wichita where we split up the TIF like this? So my response is in Wichita, there have been project plans that have been amended to redefine project areas as projects have presented themselves. Yes, that has happened in Wichita. Okay, uh, the second question is, um, was this discussed, did we know about this when we were negotiating with UPC? Yeah, nothing has changed from back when the development agreement was approved earlier this year, right? When that development agreement was approved, and one party of the three-party agreement um, was willing to remove themselves, and we now entered into a two-party agreement, and now that party has an opportunity to pursue the development uh, that was originally contemplated, again, with the minor changes to it's no longer office, it's now multifamily residential, and now we're talking about owning a parking asset versus it being privately owned. A few minor, nothing has changed that all of that same information that was presented to you all several months ago 
this is just the entitlement process going forward to make all of that happen, right? So uh, things like, you know, are height amendments going to be appropriate? So for building heights, right, are um, uh, occupancy numbers going to be appropriate, right? So all of those platting, those kind of things, all of that, those are the entitlement processes that have to be lined up in order that early next Actually, year, yeah. when a building permit application is submitted, they have all the entitlements in place in order for a building permit to be issued. But did they give any indication that this is the, the route that they were wanting to take? <laughs> oh, absolutely, yeah. We, we kind of eyes wide open. We knew that we were going to have to go through some planned unit development amendments um, and that we were going to have to possibly do some replatting and those kind of things in order to set the stage for them being able to get a building permit. The development agreement laid out really high level, right, things like tax increment financing, things like uses, things like who was going to be responsible for what, when, where, and how, right? The development agreement lays the foundation. <coughs> the next layer is you got to kind of frame up the context of getting the entitlements in order so that they can get the building permit application submitted and approved. Thank yep. you. So the action on Tuesday, again, is just the hearing to set the date for November 21st to do the full presentation and get all the facts. Correct. If we delay it, because we don't have a full body, and I appreciate that, Mayor, um, the earliest we'd be looking at rescheduling this would be November 7th because the 24th is a consent, the 31st is no meeting, and then so now we're looking at three weeks. What does that do to that November 21st date? Does that push it back three yes. weeks? So yes. now you're looking at the end of December. I'm worried about, and trying to be consequent, of the timeline and the benchmarks that we set in place with this project. Right. We have very aggressive goals to get this built and operational too. So the longer we delay it on a procedural matter, puts us more at risk. So I I'd appreciate us being here, but I think for just setting a hearing date, I think we need to move forward. Right, and, and, and that's, that's the, the, the balance we play, right? Uh, where um, if we put the hearing, if we put this item off, it puts, puts off the entire project three weeks. Um, what is the consequences of that? Uh, and uh, so it, that's, that's, and I, I love the feedback because that's what we're going into this weekend thinking about, right? Like what, and we're all going to be out in the public this weekend, having opportunities to, to interact <laughs> with folks um, and to, to have these conversations. Uh, everyone in this room, I believe, uh, except for probably Troy, uh, some type of public hearing, public event scheduled where we, we can have these conversations. And I think that my um, comments, uh, uh, besides um, being somewhat shorthanded on the bench, uh, is is basically there is an option uh, as we move forward. If we're hearing from the public that, hey, we wanted, we, we want more info on this, uh, uh, th then there is that option. Uh, so that's more of what, what I'm uh, trying to discuss as we move forward is that, that uh, we, we should keep an open mind as we go into the weekend, interact with the people we work for, uh, and then when we come back uh, on Tuesday, um, we, we might have a different game plan. But you, you are right and correct that the, uh, the purpose is to schedule the public hearing. It's not to create the new TIF. Right. And I think that might have gotten lost in some online discussion uh, by people who are um, uh, seen as, as uh, folks who are somewhat watchdogs. Uh, so, you know, can we, how, how do we, um, how, how do we uh, engage to ensure that folks are aware of what what the process is and what the intentions are. So I just want to throw that out there. If you're getting a lot of pushback uh, and we need more time to, to dialogue uh, with the public, there is that option. However, the consequence is it does get pushed back a couple weeks or three weeks. And what does that look like? So do we have any plans for a public engagement on this? Maybe a meeting that people can come to and ask the questions and get them answered? So, um, Obviously, we're open to receiving questions and responding to uh, those questions at any point during the process. Uh, this item did uh, go before Metropolitan Area Planning Commission yesterday afternoon, did receive a vote, if I'm not mistaken, of 10 to 10 1, to 1 uh, recommendation for that was consistent with the plan and was consistent with everything that they had available to them. Um, and so 
Yeah, we're, we're certainly open for conversation. As far as stakeholder engagement, I'm not really sure. Again, the, nothing has changed in the plan, right? Um, again, the only things that have changed in the plan is that they're not doing office anymore. They're doing multifamily residential, and it's now sort of a public parking garage rather than a private parking garage. Those are really the only two nuances that have changed in the entire timeline. Um, there's maybe a third one is there is a party to that that is no longer engaged, right? Um, and so nothing has changed. I'm not sure what kind of community stakeholder engagement we might yeah, engage in. Yeah, I mean, just in. something at the library where sure. people who really pay attention to this kind of stuff can come and dialogue uh, with. We are certainly, staff. I will certainly make myself available. My staff will be certainly make ourselves available if that's the desire uh, of city council to make ourselves available for a, an open house somewhere. Yeah. We, we can certainly do that. Or if there's direct specific questions that we can respond to, certainly reach out to our offices. Yep. The, the whole TIF thing is very confusing to us as well as the public. Sure. I think the public's main concern is they want to they want to feel good that um, we're going to get the appropriate debt service to pay off the stadium and not have to get into taxpayer dollars. Yeah, correct. Right. All right. Well, uh, I don't think I don't think the intention is to come into a, a real decision on this item. Obviously, now that we're just going over the agenda, but we do appreciate the uh, pretty much the, the bonus presentation. So thank you uh, for being here to help us talk about this a bit more. Uh, Mr. Manager, what, what, what else we got? Hold on just a second, please. All right. Um, number two, uh, would approve a $70,000 budget adjustment to reflect uh, stronger activity at the golf courses than we even anticipated when we had the amended budget for the year. Also, uh, we anticipate that we'll, the golf system will be able to transfer at least $500,000 uh, to the capital improvement project fund uh, to finance improvements at the golf courses. What did you say? Five hundred thousand dollars. Just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. Five hundred thousand into my account. <laughs> okay, page three, number three. Uh, this would approve five point one million dollars in uh, improvements to city-owned facilities um, and one point two million dollars for additional improvements to C two, and that's all for twenty twenty four. Number four would approve one and a half million dollars to pave 17 dirt streets or street segments in 2024. Number five would approve 13 million dollars for improvements to 350, 315 lane miles of streets in 2024. Number six uh, would approve a contract for collection of delinquent uh, court fines, fees, and costs. Number seven would approve $100,000 for the installation of new data cable in city-owned facilities. That's all I have on page three. On page four, number one is a conditional use. Um, it's in front of you because there was a resident petition in opposition. Down at the bottom, non-consent housing agenda, number one would increase the payment standards for the 2024 Housing Choice Voucher Program. <coughs> Page five, um, under council member agenda number two, uh, this would be uh, the start of a discussion on amendment to the non-discrimination ordinance. Um, it's requested by the mayor. Mayor, I don't know if you wanna summarize it at all. The, uh, sorry about that. Uh, yes, the non-discrimination ordinance, this is to update the ordinance to include um, hairstyles. Uh, that are uh, natural hairstyles for people of particular races uh, so that that itself isn't discriminated against. It's a best practice and we're working with the national organization uh, as well as local uh, legislative leaders uh, to, um, to, to uh, create this amendment. And of course, our legal staff. Thank you so much uh, to our legal staff has been working on this as well. Um, I know that uh, Councilmember Johnson has also uh, uh, been in these meetings. He might have something to add to this. Uh, but uh, basically, it's uh, ensuring that, that we uh, continue to, to modernize the non-discrimination ordinance so that it better serves the public. And we will have, um, I think, Michelle, uh, who will be joining us for, from an organization that focuses nationally, but their 
territory is really Missouri and Kansas uh, to come in and talk more uh, about. Um, so we'll have to have Zoom set up, of course, uh, to or Teams uh, to talk more about uh, uh, more more extensively uh, about this item. Uh, that's all on page five. On page six, 3A, uh, this is our annual allocation for sediment control payments to property owners located in the Cheney Lake watershed. Uh, this is uh, implementation of best uh, practices uh, in order to control the amount of sediment that goes into Cheney. Cheney has water? Yeah, for the limited I mean, water it has. It's, I mean, it has more water than it would wow. if it wasn't for this work. It's wet still, but. <laughs> Page seven, uh, number seven, would approve uh, over $100,000 payment for condemnation award for the acquisition of property on West Street. Um, number nine, it would approve $134 million IRB issue for Wesley Medical Center improvements. Since 2018, Wesley has invested over $175 million in its facilities and created 105 new jobs. That investment and job um, creation uh, exceeds the targets um, had that were included in the original IRB documents. I don't have anything on page eight or page nine or page 10. Page 11 is, um, a, is the start of um, uh, uh, some improvements to the Eisenhower uh, terminal. Um, believe it or not, it's actually starting to show its age, um, eight years old now. It will approve a contract for analysis and design of uh, various terminal improvements at Eisenhower. Keep us modern and reflective of changes in technology and pra air practices. Also, we may be running out of counter space because of the success of our airlines, so we'll need to look at how to accommodate more air carriers. Uh, that's all I have, Mayor. Is, I'm sorry, did Stantec do the original design of Eisenhower? I, um, no. I don't. Do you remember who did? They've been involved in some uh, technology upgrades, I think, okay. if I remember correctly. It wasn't Stantec that designed Eisenhower, was it? No. no. Okay. Okay. But this was selected by a screening committee. Yes, it Stantec. was. Okay. Competitive process. Yes. All right. Thank you. All right. Any uh, announcements for the good of the group? Uh, no announcement. I'll add to your uh, comments earlier, Mayor. Um, Michelle is actually Michelle Watley. The organization is called Shirley's Kitchen Cabinet. And the um, amendment is based on um, something called the Crown Act that has been introduced on the state level by Senator Faust Godot. Uh, it's very important. And if anybody uh, would like to see why it's important, you can look to none other than Texas. There's a young man named Daryl George who has been suspended for having dreadlocks, which is a cultural hairstyle, which he's being discriminated against. That does happen in Kansas. It has happened in Wichita. Um, there's just nothing that legally protects people at the moment. And, and just at, at first of all, thank you so much for um, being able to pull up uh, uh, the organization and the, the person's full name. I, I, I mean no um, disrespect. Uh, and also, I believe Texas, and this might be in her presentation, has actually passed the Crown Act uh, statewide because of this. Uh, so this is a uh, something that, that uh, we've seen in other states. Uh, and. Uh, again, uh, we're, we're just following what, what I consider best practices, but yep. thank you for that. Further conversation? All right, if there's no objections, then we shall adjourn oh, Mayor, into uh, We have a, a monthly presentation from staff. We could do that once we adjourn the real meeting, Bob. Okay. The, uh, yes, we do have monthly presentation, so if there's no objection, we will adjourn this meeting and we'll roll into our monthly presentation from staff. Um, it's and it's IT. Excellent. Mike Maida was going to make a uh, brief presentation on cybersecurity. That's kind of important. <laughs> kind of, yeah. And Mike, I do have to sneak out. I mean, no, no problems. I have a 12 o'clock uh, uh, thing I have to be at, uh, and it's, the discussion went a little long, so I apologize, Mike, ahead of time. Oh, we have the fine. opioid thing, too. Oh. Oh. It's not the opioid thing.
from the chair. Just, just when I was going to talk about, you know, you would have an ordinance about hair um, <laughs> doing a discussion. Um, so just a, a, a few um, up front. One, um, I'm not going to talk about specifics in terms of, of what we're doing on the back end. Uh, hopefully everybody realizes why I'm not going to have those discussions. Obviously, I'm, I'm always here if you want to have those discussions with me um, or one of my staff one-on-one. Uh, -on -one, we would, we're open to have those anytime um, you have questions. Um, those are just not something we want to put out in public in terms of specifics. So I just wanted to get that, make that clear. Um, one of the things I want to talk about is, is cyber is more comprehensive. Um, as you can imagine today, right, everything's digital. So um, when we're talking about everything from your access cards to doing MFA to your cell phones to, right, and, and Bob was talking to me earlier about um, getting um, phishing attacks at home. Um, you're going to see more and more of that. Um, we stop literally millions of phishing uh, attempts before they ever reach your, your box. Um, still, some reach your box. And with AI um, today, you're not going to see the misspellings and the, and the obvious right things that you're, oh, yeah, I'm not that dumb, and hit delete. Um, those are, are going, you're going to see those less and less. Um, the reason I put this statistic in here is mainly because operational and mission critical technology environments. Um, I think it's important that, that we all understand that because of the nature of tech today, uh, we have some vendors that might not be really caught up. We might think they are, um, and in some cases there's not, they're not. So if you see some of those things coming back to you, um, for either a difference in funding or um, something that we have to do different, it, that sometimes that's the reason. Um, we trust vendors to have that knowledge. Um, sometimes we have already found, um, some cases they don't. So just a, that's more of a FYI than anything else. Um, you always have to throw one of these screens up, right? Because it's an attention getter. Um, City of Dallas, I know the CIO there, I talk to him on a regular basis. Um, the, the issues that they've had, if you're aware, started in May. They are now, in, are in August, they, they found uh, a number of additional issues. The reason I bring that up is to give you an idea. Now, their infrastructure obviously much larger than ours, but the forensics that sometimes it takes to understand what they've gotten into, where they've, how, how deeply they've gotten into your organization can take a long time. So that's the only reason I put that up. Fort Lauderdale, a different type of, right, that was a social engineering attack uh, where a payment was made they thought was legitimate. It was actually went to um, uh, bad actors. So um, multiple levels that we have to be aware of in terms of how we approach cybersecurity. Um, and why it's important uh, to the city. I throw the MGM in there because, as you can imagine, they spend maybe one or two dollars more than the city of Wichita spends on cybersecurity, uh, yet they were hacked. Um, that will be a, a, at least a hundred million write off for them, which I imagine for them is not as significant as it would be for us. Um, in terms of what we're, tr what we're doing, um, you guys have seen. We do um, uh, wiser training. Um, we believe that that's a, a, a valuable um, aspect. It's, it's not only for um, what you do here at work, but also what you do at home. Um, one of the reasons we like wiser was you have access to it and your family has access to it. So if you want to provide family members at home access to this information, you can do that. So, and usually they're just links, so they can go out and, and they're short videos, um, very beneficial what we found. Um, you also know we do MFA. Um, some people see that as a, a pain, and I get that. Um, it is kind of that progress towards zero trust. It's one of the steps, right, in terms of best practices. Um, 
So while it is, it is just in today's business environment, it's just one of the things that we have to do. Um, so what we've tried to do is make it as seamless as possible so it's as easy for you to, to, to use it as, as, uh, uh, as you move forward. Um, so um, October is Cyber, uh, Cyber Security Awareness Month. Um, so we'll, we're doing a, a little more of a, a ramped up campaign uh, with staff. Um, again, we believe uh, it's important not only for staff here, but what they do at home and for their families. Um, you guys are targets. Uh, you, I'm sure you already understand that. Bob is a big target. Anyone, right, department heads, um, you're, you're, you're going to be targeted. Um, people don't believe that we get attacked by nation states. We do. And we, we get attacked on a regular basis by nation states. Um, they are well funded. Um, all they're looking for are holes. Now, the one thing I will tell you, this is not the, the guy sitting in a hoodie in a basement somewhere, you know, um, on a computer, right? These are automated bots crawling the internet constantly, looking for uh, holes. When they find them, that's when usually people will get involved. But a lot of this today is automated, and especially with AI, AI on the back end is used as well. Um, you can go out and buy a kit on the dark web to, to do whatever you want to do. So it's, it's, it's kind of a, uh, in one way, it's kind of funny. It's not funny, but it's, right, you can go buy whatever you need to do uh, hacking or if you're a hacktivist. So you, my point is, you don't have to be a coder anymore. You can just go buy the services. Um, so when we're talking about the big picture, um, I just threw that in again. Uh, to make sure you all understand the expanse of what we're talking about. A lot of times people think when we're talking about cybersecurity, it's okay, it's when I'm using my cell phone or my PC. Not the case. We have camera systems. We have uh, our traffic signals, our SCADA systems. Um, so everything today pretty much that we have is connected to something. And so all of those, right, come into... Um, purview as far as cybersecurity, even our HVAC systems, right? Those are connected to the internet, not to the internet, but they're, they're all connected. Um, and the SCADA systems, obviously, you all should understand that that's a significant, right? We have to be very cognizant of that. Uh, the situations that might occur around our SCADA systems. Uh, learning and sharing, so the reason you got the JV today, um, our, our two um, cybersecurity folks are actually at, at uh, OzSec, which is actually here in Wichita. Um, so they're working, uh, learning new things. Uh, they actually hack sites. They do some, from what I understand, they do some really cool things at this, uh, which is down at the Drury if you all want to go down there and hack something later today. Um, we do a lot of, we, we're engaged in a lot of partnerships, work very closely with CISA. Um, we have held um, two meetings with local um, smaller cities, um, engaged with CISA as well uh, to help them around cybersecurity and what they might need to do. Uh, Derby's been compromised, Newton's been compromised. Um, We've had discussions with them, because as you can imagine, we have two. They don't have any. Most of the smaller communities around Wichita do not have any cybersecurity in terms of personnel. So we are trying to work through the state. That, uh, most of you know I was on the, uh, the co-chair of the task force for the state of Kansas on the cybersecurity. And part of that is taking a whole state approach. Um, and so how can we all work together and use resources um, to help when, when folks have issues. So that, in essence, I didn't want to keep you any time they put me in between you and lunch. Uh, <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I try and make it as quick as possible. Yes, sir. Um, I saw in there about email filters. Mm -hmm. um, every once in a while, like, on my phone, I'll see somebody sends an email. Then I go back to try and check it. I'll remember the name. Filter scrapped it. Not there anymore. Yep. So is there a chance that we have a 
constituents reaching out to us and their emails aren't getting through the filter process? Um, probably not. Usually what happens if um, uh, we have bots that check that, um, if it is something that's been uh, blacklisted, then we don't send it through. If it's not, then we usually send it through and give you the opportunity to look at it um, and see if it's something that you want to. Now that, that, that will be, we're testing that in IT now. So probably by the first of 24, you'll start to see those in your email where you can, you can say, oh no, that, that's good, I know that person, and you can, you can get those. Usually we will uh, contact you um, and let you know that, hey, you've got this, and we're not real sure about it. Okay. So, uh, so no, that, should, that should not be occurring. Okay. If it is, you need to let us know. Okay. Uh, second question, mm -hmm. um, are there any outside groups that um, oversee the vendors? I know you talked about we trust the vendors to um, take care of their issues, sir, but kind of the Ronald Reagan trust them. We, and we do that. So, so that's so. The reason I brought that up was, um, it, in some cases, um, departments might feel like we're kind of getting in their business, and really what we're doing is doing that trust and verify. Um, so right now we kind of act as that as that arm, if you will, um, to have those discussions and make sure that that uh, um, our departments are, are moving forward in the appropriate. There, there have been training sessions and discussions in finance, especially. And um, if you were, we, I think we talked about this a few years ago. We had a, a person in finance who questioned a payment request that came through and actually did the extra due diligence, and it turned out to be a fraud, and uh, we didn't make the payment. So, uh, but that's the social engineering piece of this that isn't going to just pop up and be caught by a filter, that type of thing. Yeah. Just figured I'd make some of my conservative friends here happy and quote Reagan for them. <laughs> I don't have any questions, but I, I do want to say thank you for, for the work you all are doing in a different partisan role. I had a few years ago, we had a briefing from the FBI about that. And it, I know it's a lot deeper than what you said, but I know that's some, some tough work. So definitely appreciate that. Yeah. there's. There's a lot more going on. It's that proverbial behind the curtain being from Kansas thing. Yeah, there's there's a lot. Yeah. Yeah, there was, I guess for everyone here, there was definitely a warning about social media yeah. and how your pictures and private information is used to make people think it's you. Yep. And the scary part today is I can literally use AI to copy Bob, Bob's voice yeah. and have it call you and it will sound like Bob. We should do that. Let's talk. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, you know, that's been the problem, right? As Jim, Mike and I have talked about this, but I, you know, I think we've all seen it on television and it's actually happened with businesses where someone will call and say, I forgot my password. They'll call our help desk mm -hmm. or a help desk. And it sounds just like, you know, the individual mm -hmm. and, um, you know, that's why we've got to have another layer of security on that. AI is changing, changing the game quickly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. You can't just go back to paper and tell the guy and shoot things around with the, the kids. Smoke signals. Hey, it's a little more secure, right? Vice Mayor, that's all we have. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Mike. Yep. Thanks, Mike. Yep. Everybody have a good day. Thanks. For which?